So now that we've talked about concurrency and its sibling synchronization, which is what you need to enable interaction, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about parallelism. And at first glance, these things, these concepts seem very similar, but in upon closer inspection, you'll discover that they actually are not as similar as they look at first glance. So we're going to talk about the meaning of key concepts in, in parallel computing. And you'll see that whenever you talk about parallelism, you see stuff that looks kind of like this. I'll explain what this means in a second. Very common way of thinking about parallel computation. And then I'll kind of talk about how these concepts are supported in Java. And this is really the focus of the course that we're going to be doing. So the stuff we're about to talk about here is really the secret sauce of what makes this course wildly different from the course we'll take do next semester. So parallelism is a form of computing that performs several steps on multiple processor cores or multiple processors. Back in the day, before we had multi-core processors, we had systems with multiple processors, each with its own core. But for all intents and purposes, it's about the same for both uh, scenarios. So the way that things work in parallelism is you have three primary steps. The first step is the splitting step. And what you do when you split is you take some original task or some source task or some um, originating task, and you subdivide it or fork it into a bunch of subtasks. And this decomposition or this splitting or partitioning of a task into its representative subtasks is typically done in a recursive manner. So you start with the top level task, and then you fork it into two subtasks. And then each of the subtasks, subtasks gets recursively forked into smaller subtasks. And you keep splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting until you end up with subtasks that are appropriately small. And we'll talk later about what small means. Uh, in the case of a lot of the Java code, it means you get down to a subtask that cannot be split any further. Like if you had an array of 10 elements, you might split it in half until you had subtasks of each element being one element in the array. You can't subdivide things any further. So you, you basically split things until you get to an atomically sized set of elements. So that's the splitting phase. The second phase is the apply phase. You take all of those subtasks that you've split up, and then you go ahead and run all of those subtasks in parallel. However, each subtask runs sequentially. So by the time you split the big task into the smallest atomic level subtasks, then each atomic level subtask will run sequentially, but you'll run them all in parallel. And they'll all be independent or relatively independent. Put another way, the more independent they are, the better. Uh, because then they can run without having to worry about dependencies on anything. So that's, that's the apply phase. So each subtask is processed sequentially within the subtask, and we run them all in parallel on some number of processor cores. And then the third and final phase is the combine phase. And what that does is it takes the sub results from all the subtasks that we're running in parallel, and it merges them in one way or another into a single final result. And as you can imagine, just as it took us a bit to recursively decompose everything from one task into the smallest atomic subtasks, so too in the joining phase, when we combine or merge things back together, there may be merging taking place at several different stages. So typically what you do is you do some kind of you know, pairwise merging where you take two subtasks and you merge their result, and you take two other subtasks and you merge their result, and you take those two merged results and you merge them together, and you keep doing this until you end up with one final merged result. And that's commonly called joining. So we have forking, which is about splitting. We have the apply phase, which runs all the things that are split in parallel, each one running sequentially. And then we combine all the parts back together again by joining them into one final reduced result or merged result. OK, that's, that's the high level view. And, and parallel programming is typically some variant of that. Um, the key goal of parallelism is to efficiently partition the tasks into subtasks and efficiently combine the results back together again. And that 
keyword efficiency is really important. And it's also important because it turns out in some cases, depending on what you're doing, it's inefficient to split certain data structures. And it's inefficient to join certain data structures or combine. And so as a result, parallelism is not a win at all. So the key point of parallelism is to optimize performance. And you can optimize performance along several dimensions. You can optimize throughput, which is basically how much information can you get by per unit time. You can optimize scalability. How many of something can you deal with? You can optimize latency, which is how long does it take to do any given thing. And uh, different types of applications require different optimizations along these dimensions. Does anybody know what this, uh, what this is a reference to? The, the volume uh, knob that goes up to 11? So th there's a great movie called This is Spinal Tap, which you should see if you haven't seen it sometime. And it's a rock band. It's a parody of a rock band. And this guy is like really proud because he has an amp that goes up to 11, not 10. And they tell him, well, why, why is it any louder if it goes up to 11? Because it's just, you know, it's just like taking 10 and renumbering it. He's like, because it goes up to 11, not 10. It's louder. So it's a great classic scene from that movie. Parallelism works best when threads share no mutable state and don't block. So once again, this concept of mutable state comes back and rears its ugly head. And if you want to learn more about this, take a look at this link, why shared mutable state is the root of all evil, uh, which is probably true. So don't want to share state. You don't want anything shared while these different independent subtasks are running in parallel. And we don't want to block. We can sometimes block, but we really would prefer not to block. If you don't share state and you don't block, you can really, really, really scale things up. And because of this, Java has a really cool mechanism known as the fork join model or the fork join framework. We'll talk more about that later in the course, and you get a chance to program with a fork join framework. And the fork join framework basically supports all this forking and joining stuff I've been talking about. And it also supports this interesting concept of work stealing. So fork join is a way of trying to be able to do parallel computations without having to share state. And it has this cool thing called work stealing, where threads that are currently idle and have nothing else to do will go and look around and find another thread that has too much work to do, and it will steal the tasks or the subtasks from those other threads. So work stealing makes sure that everything runs and doesn't block and keep the CPU's cores humming along at full capacity. OK, so that's a quick overview of the concept of parallelization. Let's now talk about what Java provides to support parallel computing. And Java, modern versions of Java, later versions, Java 8 and beyond, support three primary frameworks that make parallel computing easier to do by providing support for it out of the box. At the core of all this stuff is something called the fork join pool, which, or the fork join framework. And it's basically a pool of worker threads. And we'll talk a lot more about that. You'll get a chance to program with it. I'll show you what it looks like inside and out. It's very cool. And the fork join pool came along in Java 7, which was released around 2010 timeframe, so about a decade ago. And back in those days, Java did not have all the cool functional programming features it does now. So the fork join framework is, a, is an object-oriented framework. It's not a functional programming framework. But it's very cool, very optimized, works quite nicely on modern multiprocessor machines. When Java 8 came along, people said, you know, this fork join thing is really powerful and it's scalable and it's efficient. However, it's really tricky to program. So let's make life easier for the developer. And so they built this thing that they call the Streams Framework. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about streams. And you get a lot of chance to play around with streams. In fact, after you're done with assignment 1B, the next assignment will start you with sequential streams followed by parallel streams. And sequential slash parallel streams provides a functional framework in order to be able to program tasks and subtasks in the fork join pool without requiring you to know all the gory details about how to split things up and fork them and join them and all that good stuff. 
So it allows you to be able to program using a functional programming model that allows you to compose functions together. Kind of hinted at this earlier in the course. And you can run this thing in parallel. And it's really cool. And if you look very carefully here, you can see we've got a pipeline of so-called aggregate operations. And this pipeline of operations pulls data through and applies various behaviors. And if you look very carefully, you see that these behaviors, which are the parameters to the, to the aggregate operations, these behaviors are defined using method references or lambda expressions. So all the stuff that we talked about in terms of the foundational Java functional programming features, like the lambda expressions, method references, functional interfaces, and so on, those all show up as a way to parameterize the behaviors that these aggregate operations perform as data elements flow through the stages in the stream pipeline. And that'll all become a lot more clear once you start programming with it. It's really, really super cool. And it's easy to take a sequential program and trivially paralyze it by just saying parallel stream, and boom, you get things to run in parallel. There's another framework called the Completable Futures Framework, which provides a so-called reactive asynchronous model of computation. Under the hood, Completable Futures use the fork join pool, or could use the fork join pool. Under the hood, parallel streams use the fork join pool. Um, but the programming model that you see is quite different from programming the fork join pool directly and or programming streams or parallel streams. Uh, and the main reason for that is typically with streams and parallel streams, you do synchronous behaviors, whereas with completable futures, you do asynchronous behaviors. Now, it turns out you can combine the two, but we'll talk about that later. So with completable futures, what you're doing is you're basically doing an operation asynchronously in the background, and you get back something called a future. And a future is basically a proxy that a program can use to keep track of the state of a computation it's executing in the background. And then as the computation in the background completes, that triggers the future. And then the, the program that has got access to the future can get the result and do something with it. And the thing that's really cool about completable futures is you can chain together pipelines of actions or so-called completion stages that run in a very clean and stylized way when a previous asynchronous operation completes. And so we'll talk a lot more about that later. So that, that'll be the last part. Uh, later part of the course, we'll do completable futures. It's a, um, a bit more complicated way to program because it's asynchronous and that requires thinking in different patterns and thinking in different styles, but it tends to be very, very scalable and, and performs very well. So that's why people put up with the complexity of programming with it, because it's very, very efficient. OK, um, there's an excellent talk by Brian Getz, who's a Java uh, architect. And he talks about the evolution of Java from concurrent to parallel programming. I will kind of give you the highlights of this shortly. I think we'll get to it today. Um, but I, I very highly recommend you watch his tutorial. He, he doesn't focus on all the nitty gritty as much as he gives you the big picture view. And one of the key points he makes, which I think is the key thing I want you to take away with at this point in the discussion, is that Java 8 and beyond combined functional programming with fine-grained data parallelism in order to more effectively leverage the newer generation of multi-core and many-core processors. And the reason why this matters is that if you take a look at what's happened, the number of cores has gone up quite a bit over time. And so there's a lot of cores. And so you would think, oh, we're going we're to leverage these things. We're going to be able to use them in effective ways. And we're going to get all these speed ups. But unfortunately, in practice, we really haven't gotten as much of a speed up as we had thought because it was too hard for mortal programmers to take effective advantage of all these multi-core processors. Proving yet again that software is what's driving innovations in technology um, more and more than hardware. Or maybe a better way to put it is lack of software advances makes it hard to leverage the hardware advances. And so what Java 8's trying to do is they're trying to make it so easy to program fine-grained data parallelism that we can do a better job of actually getting the speed ups we're expecting
that we should get from the hardware, but it's just too hard to program with the more traditional ways of writing software. So that, that's one of the key take-home points from his talk. Okay, so that's the end of the overview of parallelism in Java, and that is what we're going to focus on in this course. So that's the, the whole goal, is to cover that.